Our second reader tonight is Alice Duggan. Alice has been a finalist for the Mentor Series over the past few years, so it was a delight when I received the winning manuscript numbers from poetry mentors Leslie Adrian Miller and Tracy Smith to look up manuscript 31 in my database and see the name Alice Duggan in the next box. A retired preschool teacher, Alice has worked in a variety of genres, starting with early reader books, then shifting to essays, and for the past 10 years, concentrating on poetry. During our orientation to the program, Alice told the group that she wanted her poetry to reflect plain speech and not be boring. As you will hear tonight, there's no danger of that. In fact, when it was suggested in seminar this morning that it is the poets who are the mischief makers, all heads towards, turn towards our next reader. Please welcome Alice Duggan. Martin made such beautiful thank yous. I just want to second them. Um, Jared really does do a, a very complex job of planning and choreography to make this program work. And is the microphone working? A little closer. A little closer. Um, and we are indeed all of us very grateful. And thank you to you all for coming tonight. I uh, also want to say thank you to my husband for always behaving as though writing is a normal thing to do. <laughs> When interviewed about her tale, she said, it's just my good fortune, otherwise hard to explain. Hard to believe the chatty way it pokes the air or how it takes charge with its good blood warmth, sure of itself, or how it sways and the stiff linked bones of my spine follow along. I was at the gym when it started to grow, and I said, why not? A tripod. That's a strong base for anyone, isn't it? Isn't that true? Here on his shelf, is the lubrication engineer, 1971. And it's lubricants, sweet and cool, forming a saving wedge of oil in a bearing. And the secrets of green sand casting, 1906, where we learn that the sharper the sand, the stronger it is. But the sharpest sand is weak without some cementing material, such as clay. We could read about rope. Manila hemp is best, although it's not hemp at all, but rather a fiber of wild banana grow in the, grown in the Philippines. So it says here in the story of rope, 1928, which shows us the rope walk, the backing, the spinning, the strands wrapped around a man's waist, so there will be cordage for weighing anchor, raising sail. So there can be rum in taverns, oil in lanterns, slaves. And here is the catechism of, street, of steam next to the rivers of flour milling, next to the shooting of buffalo for the tanneries, for the belts they made to drive the shafts to turn the gears in a nation of mills. So you see, we could forget how to draw a broom, dig with a shovel. 
We could get vague about gravity, come to believe only in magic and China, where they make stuff somehow. <laughs> he would be ready. For this, I've been keeping my library, he would say. He'd raise up some fitting lubricant, some cementing material, such as clay. Told in two voices. When Uncle James broke his leg and they carried him in from the fields, the bed wasn't made. <laughs> I'm telling you this now, she begins. Aunt Allie gadding about. Imagine the shock playing cards, beds unmade. So you'll understand how it was. Uncle James sold the farm. They moved to town. Aunt Allie liked it better there. That I chose this for my work, to make things tidy. What Uncle James liked isn't recorded. Pleasant and bright. What will I learn from this mother of mine? It's part of my idea of beauty. China doll. My face hot, my braids unbraiding. You, with smooth waves in your porcelain hair and your cool skirts spread, soothing to touch, as you lay on my pillow. My smell of dank Ohio summer creaks slow in the stifling valley. Your offering of fur and age, fragrance of resinous boards in attics, and your gaze that met me beyond myself. You were as frail as a teacup. In you, I felt something strong. What I depended on came to live in my life and lived inside our stillness. Harvest. Hey says my dead mother to me. I got out. <laughs> Her voice has the glitter of mischief in it and the freedom of laughter because she looked down the long polished hallway lined with the doors of old women lonely for times no one else knows and said, no thanks, no thanks. She left without a fuss, a debt, a sigh. Can't find the notes I took on life and death. And I've misplaced, misunderstood, or broken other things that once were hers, were mine. Still, her deep laughter makes me glad. I love the notes in it of some sharp, sweet, dark fruit she went to gather after frost. His accusation. He must have cut the screen and eeled inside head first. We heard a thump. A thief, we agreed. Here to pick up a few things. I broke three eggs into a bowl you sorted the mail. Drawers opened upstairs, a frantic percussion. Then, nothing. A long silence. It was as if he'd forgotten his lines. You said, as you threw the mail away, better see what's going on. I found him slumped against the wall. 
You don't have anything, do you? <laughs> At the mall, birds with dyed feathers. All for you, they sing into my ears. They streak by me, cunning cyan, rich magenta, perch in the painted trees. All for you, the colors swelling, bowls spilling icy stars. Oh, you'll shine, they sing to me, sing to me. Your mouth will utter only lovely. Your life will glow. I believe their fluting voices, gleaming, shining, happy twitter, all for me. Still, their flat eyes, made of sequins, light insisting, glamour blaring, many turnings wear me down. When I am home again, trees are bare, birds gray, the sun down and nothing warm on the stove. As if I had slept with a stranger, I creep inside, take out for dinner, and me unloading even the things I didn't buy. Late Book of Three. Three ewes in the low pasture, wide world, sunny, expanding, while here inside, a pharmacy owns the dining room table, and her bed, in cherry red sheets, takes over the living room. Couldn't we leave all this behind? Take a little meander this morning? Not for long. As we drive along, she spins a tale. The thread begins somewhere in Ohio and stretches east. A friend of a friend is in the story, and who she divorced, and what he invented, and how her dad made chowder with salt pork, and every turn she takes has a view of the world as we follow the current, the tidal river. From high on the bridge, we look down on sails, white and gleaming of late sunshine, of winter mooring, of old Maine. We circle the fort, drive on to Searsport, where we stop, shake open the map. The endless outline of coastline unraveling makes her think of the slow killing inside her skull. Brains have a lot of coastline, too, she says, and we agree. Slowly, we drift through town, pondering what we store safe in the crenellated fortress of brain and what we cut loose. She wants it all, all held within reach. She wants the news and the layer under the news and the tangled goods in boxes arrived from the lives of all of her dead. And she wants the stories of generations, the rumors of love and the three yous in her pasture. She wants to go home and lie down. Sure, we say, and we turn and go back over the bridge, look down on the dull salt flats. It's such a tender day, soft and bright, seeming to love us, promising only the sun in our laps, colors that deepen, this moment and that. 